Welcome, Jenna. I'm so excited to have you. Um, I don't even know how to introduce you because when I first met you, um, we were part of uh, you know something uh, that brought a lot of people together during the pandemic, a time when I think everyone was hungry for connection. And then I heard you over time, but I never really knew you. And then I got to know you and realized what a powerhouse you are, um, an amazing mentor you've become to me and a friend. And I'm so excited to have you because you are someone that I look to when it comes to the world of self-leadership and taking responsibility for oneself. So aside from being an amazing mother and leader, can you introduce yourself and tell people what you do outside of that? Oh, I always dread that question <laughs> because it's just so hard to kind of put it in a box. Um, what do I do? So I guess I would categorize myself now as a health, life, business, and leadership coach. So I'm super passionate about empowering other professionals, especially entrepreneurs and executive or professional women um, to, to find their own personal power and their own, and like their own self-leadership to get them to that point to really just live the best life that they possibly can. Um, my background is in international business and enterprise technology and management consulting. And I did that for several decades. Um, and I really believe that that's kind of shaped who I am today because I got to work with a lot of different people and meet a lot of different people and travel all around the world and identify processes and systems that were broken. Um, but I think the biggest aspect of that is just the interpersonal communication and this like intense drive to really help people and um, to recognize paradigms that need shifting. So I became an entrepreneur about six years ago myself when I helped my dad opened Princeton Integrative Health, which is a foundational medicine clinic here in the Princeton, New Jersey area. So rather than prescriptions and pills, we work with people to identify root cause health challenges and then help to coach them back to health. So that's when I went back to school and um, got my health coach certification. And then I feel like I've just expanded upon the coaching and consulting realm um, and now I'm really passionate about helping other practitioners to empower their practices and their patients on their road to health and well-being. So um, what I realized about a month ago is I identify paradigms that are broken and I either work to fix them or I just recreate them. So I'm also starting a new school here in Princeton. Um, there's just, I do a lot of things, but I love everything I do. And yes, I'm a mom to two amazing kids, Carter, who's eight and Naya, who's four. And that is the hardest, but most rewarding job for sure. I love that you do so much. And as parents are listening, I think that they would definitely agree with that last part that it's the biggest job and the most rewarding, but also the hardest. And I'm so excited to talk to you today because when we have conversations, a lot of times they lead to talking about self-responsibility and leadership. And I think that after so long working with parents, working with families, it all comes down to the self-leadership of the parent. Um, and for so long, Jenna, it's been a blame, like parents took that on as a blame, like they're to be blamed, but actually we found that um, it's actually an empowerment. So I want to talk about you in that way and get a little vulnerable. Um, I think we get so used to as successful people and women, right? Like talking about um, just our accolades in that way, because we are so successful. And then when it comes to the personal realm, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, I really had a lot of work to do there. I want to know how you got to where you are now, because you have two young kids, right? Yeah. Your kids are not in their twenties yet. They're still, you're still in the thick of it, I think. Yep. <laughs> I think. So this will be an interesting conversation around leading yourself while you're in quicksand. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? You're not like out of it yep. yet. You're kind of still mm -hmm. in it. Where do we even begin? Yeah, um, you and I have had a lot of conversations about this and actually, even though we had been connected through a mentorship program, I feel like we were meant to reconnect connect in some capacity. And I remember reaching out to you after not having spoken for some time. And it was during COVID. 
Like it was during, you know, the major lockdown where I had gone from being, you know, this, this corporate person who's like out doing my thing and kind of just sitting around and still having two kids, but like with my own identity and my own freedom to now being like locked in my house for four months with my kids who now are home from school and preschool. Um, and we needed help, you know, like my husband and my husband's home, like we're all home. <laughs> it was like, wow, what, what, what do we do? Like what now? Because you're forced into this environment where it's like, you're always together. Everyone's energy is like either vibing or clashing. Um, and we had to survive that way, but we, we learned so much about one another and we learned so much about ourselves through that process. And I often get the question now in, in the business realm and business context, and especially like if I'm doing interviews, you know, and people are asking me like, how has being a parent shifted you? I have to say, despite decades of experience in corporate leadership, um, true leadership didn't happen for me until I became a parent. And when I say leadership, I don't mean like leading little humans, which I try to do in a decent way. I mean, leading myself. So, you know, through conversations with you during that time frame, as well as other parents, as well as, you know, just doing my own like deep soul searching and research on like, what is going on here? How can I make it better? Um, what I realized is that it wasn't about them. It wasn't about my tiny humans or even my husband. It was about me. And they're super cute, by the way. Um, this is so special, Jenna, because normally when I talk to parents who have, uh, you know, the last person I interviewed called it a come to Jesus moment, um, which I thought was really cute and funny and true. Um, lots of parents I talk to that have had those come to Jesus moments had them, and now they have like children who are teens and in their 20s. This is special because I'm talking to you while you have two young kids. And I know for a fact, in working with so many families in this office, and you know, that <clears throat> lots of parents that have younger children kind of say to me, no, 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 I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, but like, can we just focus on my child? And the challenge is really, communicating through that quicksand of like, but I'm trying to give you a lifeline that will save you. And they're like, no, 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 I got this by myself. And I'm like, no, but no. And you know, so how, I, I'm so curious really how you got to that place. Did something happen? Was it like trial and error? Was it just like, finally, okay, I know this. So I'm gonna put it into like, how did you get to this place so, so early? Yeah, I have to say, I think COVID had something to do with that, right? Because it put us in this environment that was just totally mm -hmm. unnatural and like out of, outside of any other experience we had had. Um, so I'm sure that that helped to accelerate the process. But I remember several instances. So um, I'm not going to specify which child, but I have one child who is very, um, you know, spirited, I'll say, like hypersensitive, just very in tune, kind of wise beyond their years, um, and probably very like me. So when I say I've a paradigm shifter, that's because I'm a challenger, like that's who I've always been, and so is this child. Um, so he knows how to push my buttons and get a reaction and a response, and so I think that having happened in normal life where it was like, we're home together on weekends and otherwise you're at school and, you know, you, you kind of cherish the time you have together over like family dinner and bedtime because it's somewhat limited and like containerized, but now you're together all the time, all day long. Um, so those buttons were just probably constantly being pushed and pressed. And I, I can't tell you. I mean, I remember one day during that time frame where my husband was working, he was on meetings. I had both the kids. We had been outside. We would go for these long either like walks or bike rides, or I'd pull the wagon. And I just picked up the phone and I called my parents, who thank God live here locally. And I'm hysterical crying. And I'm like, just come take them. Like, just, I just like can't, you know, just come take them. 
so they ended up coming and I mean, I just, I, I just remember sitting there and crying and going like, how are we going to make it? Like, how are we going to survive? And realizing that it was almost like, you know, you have to almost hit rock bottom to like realize how you're going to pick yourself up. But what I realized was that this cycle that we had gotten into was extremely detrimental to our relationship and not healthy for anybody, um, but was also something that that needed to shift. So, you know, the definition of insanity is continuing to do the same thing and getting, expecting a different result. And I mean, I had read all the parenting books. I had gone to all the you know, parenting online courses and coaches and all this stuff. Um, and it, like what I realized was that I, it, like, it's me, it's my decision, right? Like it's my decision how I let these things impact me. I'm letting a, a six-year-old at the time, like push my buttons to the point where I'm losing my mind like this. <laughs> You know, like I've led teams of people, I've traveled the world, I've like done all of these things. And this is like where I'm at right now. Right. And so I made a conscious decision at that point, which I have to remind myself of every day um, that I have, you know, it's my personal power. It's my choice. I, my energy influences my environment. And so it's how I lead myself, not just leading myself as a role model to them, but like how I let things impact me and affect me and what I do with that, that makes them, you know, a huge difference, not just for me, but for everyone around me. Mm -hmm. It's so pivotal. And I think very courageous. And I'm just imagining, because I'm human too, thinking about all of the different things that come up that, you know, the voices, the old stories that say, it's okay, or okay, now you're doing well, like, let that go. Mm -hmm. How did you stay on track? Because you've been, you've been pretty consistent. How did you stay on track with that conviction? Yeah, and it's not about perfection. It's just about progress. And it's about like, you know, if I, if I lose it now, I know it's my responsibility to apologize for that. You know, it's mm -hmm. taking ownership. It's taking ownership of your actions. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like I said, hoping to model that behavior for my kids. So, you know, every day, and I'm sure it's, there are probably a lot of parents watching this because that's what they're here for. Um, every day I wake up in the morning and it's a decision. It's a choice that I make. How am I going to show up today? How am I going to show up today for my kids? And, you know, a few other things that I realized during that time is like, probably similar to the, the person you're just speaking with. Um, I formed a persona over the course of time and I had kids later in life. So I was, I, I'm a challenger. I'm probably relatively controlling, you know, I want things to be a certain way. Um, and I realized like what that energy was doing to my children and to my environment. So I needed to infuse a lot more fun in myself and my life and like not take myself so seriously and not take my kids so seriously and not take every situation so seriously. So it was also about that and like getting vulnerable and getting silly and doing things that maybe I didn't want to do um, that were, were uncomfortable for me and just, just going there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms of self-leadership, you know, when, when parents say, I don't have time for that right now. I keep hearing that, you know, when you're trying to enroll someone in a program because you really want to help them, you hear, you start hearing the same things, right? I don't have money right now. This is too much. I don't know. The number one thing I'm hearing is I don't have time. And mm -hmm. I think that there's a beautiful quote that I love. It's like, meditate 20 minutes a day. If you say you don't have time, do it for two hours. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> because obviously, if you don't have 20 minutes in a day, yeah. then do it for, for two hours. Um, so what is that about? You know, and, and I know that you've been there. So what is that about that feeling of, I don't have time to lead myself right now. Like it just, it's got to get to, because I hear it from dads. I hear it from moms. And, there, and it's a very intense certainty. I don't have time right now. Almost like a crisis. Yeah. What do you say to those parents who are in the thick of that crisis? Yeah. I don't think you have a choice other than to find the time, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I know there's a lot of buzzwords like in our space, health, mental health, all of that around like self-care. 
self-care is not about going and getting a mani-pedi like every week or even a massage. It's about like taking a moment, checking in with yourself, like taking a breath, um, maybe having a little mantra, you know, like everything's okay. Everything's going to be okay. You know, I say a little prayer. I'm like, Jesus, please just give me strength. <laughs> <Jesus."> <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it's funny. Cause my four-year-old, I, I, she, she started doing that. Like she'll start, she actually will start doing that. She says the same thing. Cause she's like a little parrot. Um, so it's funny. It was funny to like, see that reflected. Right. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's like getting real. It's like getting real with who you are, where you are, what you need to do, putting on your big girl pants or your big boy pants and like taking ownership of the situation. Like we're here. There's no giving them back. <laughs> like This is real. Like this is life. You know, it's not, it's not like a job where you can go, I, I hate this place. Like I hate my boss. I hate this job. I'm going to go find a new one. Like, no, you're in it. Right. And so you're, you're either in it to win it and figure it out and get real and do the right things, or you're going to be miserable because what doesn't work doesn't work. And continuing to do that is the definition of insanity. Hmm. <clears throat> Jenna, I didn't share this with you yet, but I want to and ask what you think, because you just talked about identity. Just yesterday, I had a, uh, a child and his dad um, in my office and they got a new dog. And the dog has been a blessing to the family for many reasons. But as we're in session, one of the things that is going on is this child is not taking the lead of the trainer for the dog and doing the, the right things with the dog. So as we're having this conversation, the dad leaves, child and I are talking and he says to me, I just feel like I don't want to be near the dog. Just sometimes just the dog is not doing what I say. And you know, I, I don't like it. And then he says, I just feel like my child's childhood's been taken away. Oh, because what happened was the dog is cute and fluffy and a puppy. And then it turns into something of a responsibility and the responsibility. And I said, well, do you want to give the dog away? Many people rehome dogs. And he says, no, I said, well, to keep the dog and all its cuteness and the play that you have, you know, there's also a responsibility of keeping the dog alive and teaching it how to be in the home because it's not in the wild and all of these things. And then when dad came in, it was such a beautiful parallel of when our identity shifts, when responsibility of, of caring for a living being comes into play. And we saw it with a child younger than 10 and the father was just struck in a sentimental way at the pa the parallel of what he and his partner are going through in raising him as their mm -hmm. son. So with that, there's a big universal shift that happens when you become a parent or responsible for something and keeping it alive, not like a plant, but like a being, right? That you wanna give wings to so it can make decisions in life. How did you deal with that identity shift? How did you deal with that true, real feeling? Like that little boy was saying it. He's like, just feel like my identity has been taken away. You know, like, I just feel like I can't be myself anymore. Yeah. How, how, what, what advice would you give to him or what advice would you give to a parent who feels that way? It's an interesting question because when Carter was born, they like said I was like doing this corporate thing, jet sitting all over. And I knew that my life was going to change extrinsically. Like I wasn't going to be jumping on, you know, a red eye over to London every week, but um, I didn't realize how much it was going to change me intrinsically. So I think I was already like going through this. Who am I? What am I going to do? What am I going to be? Um, and I, that was a struggle for a period of time. Um, I embraced aspects of it and I resented other aspects of it for sure. And, you know, you have to kind of come to terms with that, that life has shifted and changed. And then I want to say when he was like three or four, I realized that I had become something that probably was cultivated or created from expectations of my parents and those and others around me. But maybe that wasn't who I was truly meant to be or who I truly wanted to be. 
So I went through this process and I, I defined it. I actually, I call it unbecoming because it's like you became something to a certain point. And I think especially having kids later in life, you know, I, I was already who I thought I was. And then it was like, wait a minute, this isn't who I really am. So, you know, that was, there was just so much shift and transformation during that time. That was when I, you know, started to think about like getting back into the health and wellness space. I originally had wanted to be a doctor and I and ended up not being, which everything happens for a reason, but it's like, how do I get back to like what my heart wants and what my soul wants as this like newly formed and evolved person. And what I realized is, and I continue to realize this, is our kids are here and they're actually our greatest teachers. Like there's so much about myself that I never would have delved into or dug into or like done the deep work if those buttons had, hadn't been pushed, if, you know, the demons inside hadn't like bared their ugly heads, um, where it forced me to step back and say like, whoa, wait a minute, right? Like, who are you? What, what are you? Like, what are you doing? Is this the right thing or not the right thing? Who do you want to be, right? Like, who do you want, who do you want to be? How do you want to show up in the world? Um, so it is a process. There is no question about that. And it's not easy. Um, I think if you can become conscious about that and accepting about that and vulnerable to that process earlier on, rather than fighting it, it makes it a lot more easy. Like, what is the situation trying to tell me, right? What am I meant to learn here? Mm -hmm. It's helpful. I think what you're bringing up is so important. And it's that um, we, you and I have talked about, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. And I find through being a Sherpa for people and just kind of having an insight into their lives, noticing that there's a pattern of, um, and I say this often, you have your life, you get yourself together, you're ready to have a child, especially if you're having one later on in life, which is happening more and more. I'm seeing more and more parents, including myself. I will hopefully be you know, a mom soon. It will be later on in my life. And then you have a kid. And all of, those, all of those boxes that you kind of put away and said, I dealt with that and I did that and don't want to look there. Yeah. They push those buttons that weren't pushed and they unpack those boxes that you didn't want to unpack. And then you're kind of left having to deal with that. Um, and the, that is the you, is dealing with you. Um, and you can see that it's a choice to see that as an opportunity or as a, you know, something to resent. Mm -hmm. And cho choice is part of self-leadership, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the biggest part of self-leadership. Yeah. Do you choose daily? I, you, you strike me as someone just from knowing you that you have rituals and things that you do to keep yourself um, motivated and kind of in the game, so to speak. What do you do to keep yourself motivated on a daily basis to choose? Yeah. I wish I was more habitual. I know a lot of people like super successful people have like their morning routine and the things that they do. Um, you know, I think part of it is, was, you know, for me at least going from this like kind of chaos to calm or chaos to conscious is, was taking back a little bit of my, my personal space and self-care. So you know, when things were, were rough, like I wasn't working out, I probably wasn't, do, you know, I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't giving myself the time and the space for that. So it is, a, it's partially that. Um, and I don't find it that it's every day I wake up and, you know, I say a prayer, or I do a meditation. Occasionally that happens, but it's more in the moment, right? It's like, one of the things I feel has been impactful for me and kind of identifying with my kids and understanding where they're coming from is actually to put myself in their shoes and actually think about myself at eight or think about myself at four um, and, and, and just think about it from their perspective because our kids really don't want a lot. Like, I think they want to be seen, heard and felt that they matter, um, especially at younger ages. And I also think they're like the best mirrors we ever could possibly have in seeing and looking ourselves like in the face, not only do they often look like us, but like <laughs> they sound like us, they act like us and they don't care. You know, it's like, especially to your point, like later in life, you've grown up in this society where 
people don't always tell the truth, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, you, you have a career and you have friends and even probably your parents and or your siblings, maybe your siblings are a little bit harsher on you. But for the most part, it's like you've grown up in an environment where people haven't been like direct or, or blunt or totally transparent and honest with you because they feel that they might hurt your feelings. Your kids don't care. <laughs> they don't care even if it's unwarranted you know they, they say some really kind of like mean and nasty things and then it forces you to sit and go wow like is there is there truth in that it's like super reflective is there truth in that and if there is what am I going to do about it I think that's really insightful I, I've worked with some really incredible families that are well known, you know, and to watch the kids say something to their parents that you would never say to their parents. It's like <laughs> so interesting because they really don't care because they're like, you're just mom to me. <laughs> you might be a household name to someone else, but you're just mom to me. And it is really interesting what you choose to do with that. Um, what have you learned about yourself from listening to your children? Um, so much. I mean, probably the fact that I'm often not present, that I'm constantly on to the next, like I have this super hyperactive brain, which I think has served me really well in like business and success and, you know, all of that, but hasn't served me that well in parenting because I've like, I need to be more present. I need to slow down. Um, you know, it's interesting to watch like the cycles in our house where, certain things, you know, you can see certain tensions and things that are building to the point of a breakdown um, and all the things that were being blamed for getting to that point. And then once things blow up, it's like, well, you never have time for me or you don't ever play with me or, you know, you, this one gets more time with you or this one got to do this with you or whatever. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's recognizing those patterns in them. It's recognizing the patterns in myself. It's recognizing that when I have a lot of my plate from a career or, you know, other standpoint, uh, other relationship standpoint, maybe I'm not my best self for them. So it's like learning how to compartmentalize a lot of that. And it's really just about being introspective. I think more than anything, I've never thought about myself more than I do now. And it's in the capacity of like, am I who I want to be in this moment? Or like, am I, is there, is there something that I need to do differently? Or is there a reason that I should feel how I'm feeling, you know? So there's just a lot of like introspection that goes on and it has to be conscious. So I think the awareness and consciousness around that has been big. It's uncanny how the theme of uh, giving yourself permission to just be keeps coming up with people. And I wonder if I could ask what your definition of just being is, because for a lot of people, it sounds so simple, but it's scary. Yeah. Yeah. I think for someone like myself too, and probably other people that you work with, you know, I've always had kind of perfectionist tendencies and like, there's no perfect in parenting. You can use that if you want, uh, <laughs> <laughs> cause there's not, you know? And so, um, it is, it's acceptance of who, who you are. Like there's no perfection. I think parents nowadays try to show up in that space a lot of the time. Um, there are all these expectations of parents, like being it all, doing it all, having it all. Um, and then we're constantly let down or we're playing like the guilt, blame, shame game. And so I think, you know, just the ownership of that, the ownership of like, yeah, I screwed up, right? Like, I'm sorry. I wasn't my best self for you in that moment. But being okay with that and like moving past it and learning from it. There is no perfect parent. And this is a, such a, it's a process. It's a journey as you describe it, you know, the parent of a journey and who you're going to be in relating to these dynamic humans, they're going to change. So like, we're always, it's, it's this kind of crazy dance of mm -hmm. like growth and evolution over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, but it's through those experiences and sometimes failures right? That we learn and we grow and we evolve. Like we're all human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You and I you often talk about, and you mentioned it, a paradigm shift. And you know how passionate I am about talking uh, to parents about, um, you know, 
I, I'm trying to like, you know, take them their focus away from the child and onto themselves in such a gentle way. And even Jenna, when I was doing my own research on, um, you know, the post-traumatic growth experience of parents of children with autism, even parents who have children who have other sorts of unique needs, even more so the focus is on the child, on the child, on the child, and getting a parent to focus on themselves almost feels like I'm robbing them of something or I'm doing something wrong. It's like they, you know, they really react to that. Like, how do I even do that? I don't even know how to do that. You know, even the other night I was, you know, doing my webinar and I said, you know, measure yourself here on this scale. And people started measuring their relationship with their child. They said, no, no, no your relationship with yourself. So there's this, it's difficult, it's hard, it's habitual now. What do you see as the paradigm shift in working with parents and, and how parents are to be led by people like you, by me? What should the conversation be about? Because a lot of it is about skills and tips and what to do. And then you're just left with a bookshelf of books and you know um, yeah. all of that. What's the, what's the shift in your, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I think I just said a little bit of that. It is, it's like the awareness and the consciousness about like who you are and your role in this constantly evolving and dynamic relationship. Um, I was that parent where it was like, what's wrong with them? Like, you know, trying to find the diagnosis for the explosive behavior, trying to like, you know, figure out what was going on with them. Well, like how, you know, what's going on with them? Like, why are they acting this way? Well, it's not about them. And it wasn't until I took ownership of that personally um, to look at myself in the mirror and be like, oh, wait a minute. Like, he's not like that at school. He's not like that here. What's going on here, right? What's, what's going on energetically in our house, in our relationship that is impacting this dynamic in this way? So it's, it's the introspection. It's the conscious awareness. Um, it's the vulnerability and the willingness to work on it, to like look inside yourself and say, and, and even looking back, like, you know, I was, I was pretty much an only child because I have a brother, but he's 17 years younger than me. And so growing up that way was a lot, like was different. And I wasn't forced to, um, to be in these types of relationships. I, I don't think at like a younger age to truly understand the dynamics of like family relationships and, you know, and, and even understanding now my two children and how they interact with each other, you know, it's just then it's like, just stop, like stop pestering each other, stop arguing, stop fighting, but that's what siblings do, you know? So it, it's, it's kind of been just taking a step back um, and assessing and evaluating. I almost feel like sometimes it's an outer out of body, body experience where like something's going on in my house and it's like, I float up in the air and I kind of look down and observe like, what's going on here? It's like, press pause. Like what's going on here? What are the dynamics? What are the energetics? Am I contributing to it? Um, and then how do we shift it? Because emotions are just energy in motion. So if we can impact energy, um, we can really impact anything. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, you have a husband and you um, have, a, have a beautiful relationship. What advice do you have for people who... Um, you know, don't feel like their partner's on board. They're not on the same page, which I think happens so often, you know, um, because having relationship with a person is very different than partnering with them and raising children. And so the distinction is not sometimes, it's not often um, clear to us when we get into relationships. So what's your advice on that um, for parents who want to shift the energy, who want to create that change but they're demoralized or feel helpless because they feel that they need to have this buy-in from this other person. I mean, that's also a work in progress. So like my husband and I were raised very differently. And so finding a middle ground on how we were going to parent our kids, we're constantly evolving and learning. I would say that the, the value in that is like, we're both relatively like consciously evolved human beings. And maybe that's because we didn't have kids until a little later in life. And we both had our own lives and our own stories. 
um, and our own traumas and, you know, everything that we learned from throughout that process. Um, but again, you know, it was, it was a conscious commitment to like the greater good of our household. And during that crazy time, you know, of, of like a media lockdown, like I have to say, there were challenges. I mean, I don't know any family who didn't go through challenges. And I have many friends who ended up like divorced as a result of that, because when you're stuck with people for a period of time that you're not, usually it's like a lot of things come out and you realize and you, you decide what you can live with and what you can, what you can work on, what you're not going to. And so that was really a tipping point for us where it was like, we're either going to go all in on this and we're going to communicate and have clarity and understanding and compassion and respect of both our similarities and our differences. And we're going to work together to like cultivate these tiny humans in the best capacity that we can. Um, like, or we're not. Uh, so, you know, tough conversations, like lots of emotions. Um, but again, it's a, it's a choice. Like marriage is a choice. Relationships are a choice. Every day we make a decision, you know, like we're going to do this together. So, and that's leadership, you know, that's self-leadership and that's like leadership in our marriage and it's leadership for our children. It's so. lovely. It's, it's lovely what you just said, because I think what you're also speaking to is self-leadership inside of, you know, to say, oh, this person's not going to be into it. So I'm off the hook, even though I'm complaining about being off the hook, I'm off the hook. Cause if they're not into it, I, sh I can't do it. Self-leadership is like a hundred, a hundred, not 50, 50, right? Not right, right. I'm going to do this in case you just, you know, so you have to do this. And so the, the kind of courage and, and, and responsibility that one takes on to say, Hey, something's going on here, let's communicate, or I'm, I'm going to keep bringing this up in a loving, compassionate way with candor um, until we're able to shift something. And you're right, lots of families did make those decisions um, because they were better apart than they were together um, in their partnership. And then um, other families did not. Other families decided that they were going to go on this journey together, but that took leadership from you and from him you know, coming together to do that. And that's a choice every day. I think that's really important to, uh, to, you know, kind of drive in. Yeah. Yeah. I, love that. I, like I think that. we, we have this almost like, and, and probably even more so in parenthood, like a victim mentality a little bit, like this has happened to me and now I'm forced to deal with it. And that's, and I, I have this conversation all the time when I'm consulting and coaching people in health and life and business and, you know, all of these things, like you have a choice you have a choice. Like that's all it takes is like making the choice and, and accepting the choice and being okay with the choice. And like, maybe it's not the right choice at some point, but it's okay. It's okay. Because either it's going to, it's going to be okay, or you're going to learn from it and you're going to iterate and you're going to evolve. And that's what it's about. Like that's life. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, the experience of parenthood has shown to just kind of expose people to situations where they can't hide from the truth. <laughs> and if you try to, it's very painful. But if you choose to really just say, this is what's so, <laughs> and I'm going to work with this because this is what's in front of me, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but at least you're working with something real, uh, you know? <laughs> Um, so I think that's so important. Jenna, as we wrap up, I have a very important question for you. And it's, if you were to go back to yourself before you had your first child, maybe when you were planning on that, or, you know, when you learned you were, you know, going to have your first child, um, and you had 20 minutes with her, you had 20 minutes with that Jenna, what would you share with her? What would be the most important thing that you would want her to know? I mean, the first thing that popped to my head is like, like, let it go, like surrender, take the ego out of it. Um, I think part of my challenge around transitioning into parenthood was it, it's like the one thing in life you really can't plan for because every tiny human is different. So, you know, you can read all the books and you can get all the advice and buy all the things and do all the things, but you're never like fully prepared for it. And I think trying to be the person that I am and um, 
having you know been programmed in a certain way for so long, I always wanted to be in control of things. And this is one of the things you're not in control of. And that's mm-hmm. actually, you know, going back to my husband, that's actually a place where we really balance one another out because he's always said, no matter what, we're going to do our best, but like, ultimately we don't have control of it. You know, like there are amazing parents out there that maybe end up with kids who don't make the best decisions, you know, so we can only do what we can do and we need, and we make the choices and and we need to be okay with it and accepting of it and see what results from it. So I would say like, You'd give her permission to let go. Permission, permission, absolutely. Permission to, to be like, yeah, enjoy the process, you know? Yeah. It's tumultuous for sure. Ups and downs, highs and lows. But like I said, when we opened, you know, like being a mom is the hardest job I've ever had, but absolutely the most rewarding. And um, I want to do it in the best way we possibly can for, for the best and better men of all of us. And if that means getting real and like looking at what I can be doing better um, and or accepting the things perhaps that, you know, I need to in that process. Yeah. It's permission. I love it. Beautiful. And yeah, thank you so much. And I hope that you'll be back with other chats with me as we, um, yeah, unpack what, what parents need and how we can support them. Thank you so much, Jenna. Thank you for the work you do. Appreciate you. Thank you.